For anyone who doesn't know, Citizens Online has been going for 20 years. Uh, we work around the UK in a variety of communities, helping organisations ensure that the digital age that we live in now doesn't exclude people. Uh, I'm the research manager for the organisation, James Beecher. You can find me on Twitter, James D. Beecher. And today I'm joined by Katie Knight and Anna Dolphin from our Digital Brighton and Hove project. And they'll be introducing themselves a little bit more as we go through the, the slides. Really briefly, I want to talk about why we're running today's session. Um, we know that lots of people don't have digital devices. Um, there's a slide here with a quite complicated chart from the um, Lloyds Bank Consumer Digital Index last year, which shows that um, particularly older groups are less likely to have smartphones, laptops or PCs and tablets, although the difference is a bit um, uh, more marked with tablets. There is a a kind of more comparatively high proportion of older people who do have tablets. We know that people who are new users of the internet often like tablets as a device because they're less uh, daunting perhaps than a laptop or a PC, but also less constraining than a smartphone might be in terms of the size of the screen. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about um, why you'd want to run a tablet loan scheme. That's kind of what I've just done. We're going to talk about elements you'd want to think about in planning a project. We'll have about half the session for Q&A and then we'll wrap up by providing some resources. I'll hand over now to Katie to introduce the session. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Hi everybody, I'm Katie Knight. Um, I'm project coordinator for Citizens Online um, and I coordinate the Brighton and Hove, uh, digital Brighton and Hove project. Um, and we, we run a tablet loan scheme and we have a, a group of volunteer digital champions um, who work with the loan scheme providing the digital support. So um, today I just want to sort of talk about some of the things that you might want to take into account when you're thinking about setting up a tablet loan scheme. Um, so first of all, I, I just would like to just talk a bit about project planning and really thinking about who do you want to to uh, reach as part of your scheme um, and how you're going. So you might already have a client group that you work with who um, you want to support with digital inclusion, um, or you might be wanting to reach out into the wider community. Um, but really sort of defining that, that target population for your scheme is really important. Um, and then thinking about what the needs are of those people. Um, and it may be that a tablet zone scheme is, is appropriate for those people, but it, it, when you talk to them about what they want, it may be that actually they're looking different solutions. So, so really making sure that the tablet loan scheme is the right thing to set up for the population that you're targeting. Um, I think the more work you do around here, the more likely it is to be a success. Um, okay. And yeah, and then uh, thinking about, so in Brighton and Hove, we uh, work with referrals. So we take referrals from professionals who are uh, work in the local community with vulnerable people, um, and we also take self-referrals. So um, this is an example of our referral form here. I think there's a link there if you want to have a look at it. Um, the, we use Airtable, which is a free database, uh, and this referral form auto-populates that database. So when information comes to us, um, it comes through this form and we're able to uh, comply with GDPR by uh, making sure that there's a consent statement on that form so we're uh, keeping people's data in a safe manner um so yeah please do have a look at that if you're interested in how to set up a referral form and that might be an option thanks james oh and now i'm going to hand over to anna who, who knows a bit more about this so i'm going to hand over to anna now thanks katie hi i'm anna dolphin i'm community digital champion for citizens online um so um i guess thinking about where those tablets are going to come from and there's funding schemes that people can apply to um recycling schemes um i think often people think there's lots of devices out there in the community that could be utilized um but there is some careful thinking that needs to be done around that um data wiping um older devices causing potentially barriers for people um so that's really good to work in partnership 
if you're thinking about a recycling scheme. Um, we've had in Brighton and Hove, we've had um, tablets through the devices.now um, scheme. And um, also think about commercial partnerships. Um, so really those opportunities for working in partnerships with, um, with others, other organisations um, is really beneficial. Um, you think about what, what device as well. And really that's about the needs of the user within there. Um, details like the case, is that, is, it, is that accessible? Is it wipeable? Um, everything needs to be disinfected now. So thinking about those details as well as part of your project planning. Um, so with, um, with the tablets that we deliver, um, we have, um, it's important that firstly, how are you delivering those? You need safe delivery, but um, from our learning on the Digital Brighton Hove um, tablet loan scheme, it's about uh, what we found really useful is having printouts of how to actually turn that device on. Um, when as, as we, there's so much learning that happens in the process of all of this. Um, so actually printed device, um, sorry, printed, sort of how-to guides sent out with those devices can be really, really helpful. Um, that people have got something to refer to. So that could be something as simple as how to turn the device on. Um, I remember the first batch of deliveries I did and I was doing a, um, we do a wraparound support for those devices. And my first initial phone call and um, recipients of the tablets were saying, I don't know how to turn it on. So it was, it was sort of, an evolving process of learning um, that I think as part of this it's really important so device on um, how to search the internet how to email what, what the apps do how to access those how to get to the settings um, but not to make assumptions about terminology as well um, where people who had no prior use of using technology some of the language that we it's just embedded in how we talk is um, may not be relevant to people who are quite new to it so actually using people's own language using that very descriptive approach can be really helpful um, and again thinking about how you set those tablets up um, and all this is focused around um, the needs of the people that you are working with um, thinking about the accessibility settings um, there's some great guides on ability net my computer my Hello, way counseling. Hi, um, and having Hi, having this up oh hello, things like the settings in an obvious place where people can access those. Um, it's not a one size fits all, so you need to think throughout this process what what are the needs of the users um, and what fits your organisation as well. You know, setting up tablets can take time. Um, so it needs careful planning and thinking. Um, yeah, um, so there's some really sort of helpful tips about what to put on, what kinds of apps as well. Um, things like large fonts, text to speech, translate, putting a magnifier on there. Um, um, but there are there are options for um, setting them up. Um, but I think it's having that process, thinking carefully about that process and the needs of the organisation and the individuals within that. Um, there are some auto enrolment options, mobile device management. Um, it's all down to what works for you as an organisation and what works ultimately for your users um, is, is what's crucial in this. Um, so we've had some, ah, yes. I hand over now. Thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, so the, um, one of the things we often get asked about um, for uh, tablet loan schemes is the connectivity. Um, so getting your equipment and setting it up is, is one part of that, but getting your users connected to the internet is, is, a, is another area that needs to be thought about carefully. Um, we've tried different options. Um, I'd say there's three main options for you to think about. 
Um, one that we've done quite successfully is negotiated with the provider of the equipment, uh, a, roll, a monthly rolling data package. So that's some data that they can use when they run out of that data, they would need to use a Wi-Fi connection or wait until the next month when that data package is renewed. Um, so that can work quite well for people who are low data users. Um, and you as an organization would need to be prepared to uh, pay the bill for the, the data. Um, you can supply equipment and have people buy their own data. Uh, they can look at uh, pay as you go or installing broadband. There's some links at the bottom of the slide there for some cheaper options for those things. So there's a link there to the Money Saving Expert uh, page for cheap. Uh, that's for SIM only contracts, but there's also a page for cheap uh, SIM only pay as you go options so do have a look at those um, there's also bt basics uh, which is a broadband connection um, for people on means tested benefits um, so that's, a, that's quite a cheap option for broadband is worth looking into um, and then there's another option that we we've tried with some of our donated tablets which is the tablets come with some uh, data loaded onto them um, for an initial, so that people can try it out initially, but then when that data runs out, then they have to use, buy their own data after that point. So they're, they're just things to think about in terms of connectivity. Um, we, what we know from doing the scheme in Brighton is that a lot of the public Wi-Fi options that people used to use aren't available to them anymore, um, particularly coming into winter, people aren't able to sit outside uh, and access public Wi-Fi. Um, but we have put on the slide there a little map of the public Wi-Fi, so it's worth pointing that out to people who have uh, run out of data. Um, Just one other thing to add, up, add on the, the free public Wi-Fi, obviously it is an option for people in terms of the reduced cost, but there's lots of things that we wouldn't really want to recommend people do over free public Wi-Fi, so things where they want to be more secure, forms that they're filling in with private information. So that's another thing, another reason why we need to think more, more carefully than just suggesting that people use um, free public Wi-Fi. Thanks, James. Thanks for that. Um, and then I, I just want to talk a little bit about what happens next. I, I saw in the quest, question, uh, sorry, the chat box, there was a question about this. And I think this is a really, really good point to think about this right at the beginning of your planning. Um, is what happens next? So once you've identified that somebody is digitally excluded and you've supported them to have a tablet for a period of time um, and hopefully offer them some support with that, what's going to happen to them when that tablet loan period comes to the end? Um, so thinking about their needs, um, some of the options to think about are, um, could you as an organisation support them to apply for loans or grants to access more permanent options? Or could you look at their budgets and, and find an op option which meets their needs once they've had a try with, with a tablet? Um, but thinking about how you make sure that they remain uh, connected after the tablet loan scheme is a, is a really important point. Um, and then thinking about what happens to the device. So in our tablet loan scheme, the device is returned to us and then we wipe all the data um, to, and reset it up from the beginning. Um, and we let the client know that that's what's happening so that they don't feel worried or insecure about their data uh, go, going to somebody else. So it's really important to think about how you comply uh, with the data protection around your device. Thanks, James. So I was just going to say a little bit more about something that we've talked about on previous webinars, which is that, you know, it's not just about giving people those devices. Um, Anna's sort of hinted at this, that there's, it's really important that there's wraparound support for people. We can't make assumptions that people will are just lacking a device. They may also be lacking the skills to use that device or the confidence to use that device or um, the confidence to feel that they can use it safely and securely. So we recommend a digital champion approach where there's an individual person allocated to that user who can help them through the process. Um, the, the paper forms that Anna mentioned that go out with the tablets include a phone number that the people who, can, who are using those tablets can, can get in touch with if they face a difficulty. When we're talking about digital championing, there's lots to say, so I'm only gonna do a really quick overview here, but some of the things we like to talk about are finding a hook something that's of interest to the learner rather than sort of pushing them down a predetermined ideas about what you think they need to know starting with something that's of interest to them a hobby or something they'd like to find out more information about that you can show them how they can do that online 
Anna mentioned language previously. You know, we really recommend following the language that learners are using themselves to describe things rather than talking about things in unfamiliar jargon to them, which isn't just complicated jargon. It might be just simple things about how we refer to icons, for instance, on a screen, things like that might not be familiar terminology. So really try to be led by learners around that. Um, we always talk about patience, that what makes a good digital champion is not their ability to have lots and lots of IT skills. Um, digital champions might well be looking things up themselves in terms of how they help a, a, a learner to do something. But in having patience and that, that engagement with someone to make them feel comfortable and build a sense of trust over a period of time. Um, sometimes we do end up using uh, remote software or things that... Uh, where we're controlling the device for a user at a distance because of COVID. And that's something that could be very scary for a learner. So having built up a sense of trust with them beforehand is really important. And finally, checking in and encouraging learners, you know, not just giving them the device, maybe running at one session with them, but checking up on how they've been getting on with things later on and giving them a sense of encouragement about any progress that they're making. There are some particular things that we need to consider at the moment, particularly about doing things remotely. So I've mentioned, you know, screen sharing or remote access, which might be particularly uncomfortable for learners, but there are tools out there that can help you do that. At the moment, we're doing a lot of our support over the phone, which raises lots of challenges. When it's possible, it's great to be able to do things over video call or conferencing. But again, a lot of learners will need support to be able to get to the point where they can do that. Um, signposting to um guides for people now there's two two guides that i want to mention here one is um uh, guides around digital champions there's a great set of guides for um uh, acting remotely as a digital champion from one of our partner organizations digital unite there's some of them examples on on the right getting started as a remote digital champion and so on but also you'll be as a digital champion signposting people to guides yourself uh, and publicising your ability to help is going to be really important too. And lastly, we'll end on a positive note. Some of what we've been talking about today is how there's a lot to think about in terms of setting up a tablet loan scheme, perhaps a little bit more than people might have thought. But we've got some nice stories to finish our presentation with before we get on to the questions. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, I, we just wanted to tell you about um, Derek's story. Uh, Derek was somebody who was referred to our tablet loan scheme um, by his uh, dementia support group. Um, and he came to us as somebody who didn't have any digital equipment and uh, had no digital skills or very, very uh, low digital skills. Um, and Derek was uh, offered one of our loan tablet, uh, tablets and support with a digital champion. And he worked with the digital champion to uh, learn how to use the tablet. And then when he became comfortable and familiar with it, he was able to purchase his own one. So he, he returned the lab, the loan one to us and, and was able to choose one for himself. Um, he's still working with our digital champion. He checks in with him every now and then to make sure that everything's going well. But he's now able to do things like access music on YouTube. He um, participates in his dementia group via Zoom. Um, it's, it, it, there's a really lovely uh, video of Eric talking about his experience which is on our YouTube channel, uh, the link's in the slide there. Um, and I'd really recommend uh, having a look and, and watching that because I think it's a really good example of um, how, how rewarding doing digital champion work is and how rewarding having the loan scheme is. And we're so lucky to hear some of these lovely stories on a, on a daily or, or, or weekly basis, um, people coming back to us and telling us how much it's changed their lives and, and how enriching it is for them to be able to be in contact with friends and family, um, particularly during this really difficult year that we've been having. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Katie. And yeah, I just say, you know, we've we've been doing a little bit of that, of our own sharing of those stories, but it's certainly something you'd want to plan in how how you're going to back, go about doing that, how you're going to go about collecting those stories and sharing them with other people, whether that's the people who are funding your project or whether that's the wider public that you want to kind of let know that you're running this project so that others who might benefit can hear about it or other people that might be supporting you. So we'll move on to questions. Any um questions that you have about setting up a tablet loan scheme or running one, but also we'd like to hear from any of you who are already running tablet loan schemes about what your experiences have been. So I'll, I'll get out of screen sharing now and we'll get to say hello to you all. So 
nice to see a smile and away from everyone if that's okay and i think uh hopefully uh, jenny will have helped pick out a question for me someone's asked about um i'm not going to see the name of this someone's asked about a formal loan agreement i don't know who that is who, who asked about that do you want to just uh is that keith do you want to unmute yourself and uh, just say a little bit about that question Oh, or maybe Keith. I, I think it may have been Keith whose uh, microphone isn't working. Somebody let us know. Keith, is your microphone not working? Sorry. Okay, okay, no worries. Well, we'll, we'll just answer the question about the formalised loan agreement, but if we don't, then pop something in the chat box and we'll we'll, we'll answer it further. Um, James, shall I, shall I talk about the... Yeah, so um, in Brighton and Hove, we uh, ask our participants to sign a loan agreement. Um, it just lays out what we expect from them and what we are offering. Um, and then it talks about things like the uh, data protection um, and uh, about their responsibilities um, to keep the tablet safe and to let us know if anything should happen um, to return it to us. Um, I can, I'm sure we could supply a copy of our loan agreement for anybody who wanted to have a look at that. Yeah, if anyone's got um, specific questions about some of our resources, if you get in touch with us privately and I'll share our email addresses at the end, then you'll be able to, um, we'll be able to share what we can with you. Um, Catherine Gulati, can I come to you? You've got a question. Yes, hello. Sorry, I haven't got my uh, video uh, working at the moment, but um, we're about to set up a loan scheme. Um, we're about to recruit volunteers and clients uh, for older people. And I'm just wondering about if the older people want to do things like doing online shopping. It'll raise issues about the volunteers having access to potentially their um, bank details, passwords, that sort of thing. So I just wondered how people have dealt with this issue. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Catherine. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think it sort of brings up um, issues around safeguarding. And I think as, as uh, organisations working with vulnerable people, um, it's something that we need to always take um, you know, on board. And when we're setting up new, uh, new services, we need to be thinking about that all the time. Um, for our volunteers, um, to, to begin with, all of our volunteers have an enhanced uh, DBS check. So we start with that. Um, and then we, um, we, we're aware that our digital champions are going to have access to some of those people's details, but we try and limit that and we try and uh, work with them to, uh, for example, our digital champions will support people to learn how to set a, a good safe password, but they won't do that for them um, and they won't they won't they won't look at the password that the person has set but they'll teach them how to set a good password um things like banking can be difficult we would expect our digital champions to work with somebody to learn the skills to be able to do that but not to access their bank account with them um uh, i'm yeah I, I, think, I just feel like anna might have some more things to say there anna do you want to jump in yeah, and I think it's really important to sort of have that that clear communication with the um, people that are supporting people with their digital skills about about what is what is appropriate and what isn't, and it, it is challenging. Um, you know, trusting you, you need to be able to trust your um, volunteers or the people that are supporting people, um, but you know, often that kind of I'm going to turn my screen off while you put your password in approach um, that that can be quite helpful. Um, and and kind of just just you know I will I will turn my screen off and turn away for that. But it's it's really important that um, yeah people's um, privacy and security is is upheld. Um, so having those policies in place with the people that are supporting people with the digital skills about what is acceptable practice and what isn't, and being very clear about that with your with the people supporting. Yeah, yeah. So all all are yeah just answering that. That latest question from Shona. So all our volunteers have enhanced DBS checks. Great. I hope that helps, Catherine. And we'll, we'll move on to the next question, which is uh, Stephen Elsden. We can do that one. Or... Yes, I, I, I put Because I've been raising my hand since. Oh. 
I put various things in the chat. Which one were you referring to? Was it the question about what happens at the end of the scheme, which uh, one of your speakers has talked about? Um, yeah, because we, we, we have got a lot of money from Barclays Community Programme where they were given our £100,000 grant. So that's that's funding a load of devices and data plans. I put in the chat some of the things we've got. We talked to the people who ran the devices.now scheme and we thought to some of their supply partners like three. So we've got massive discounts on preloaded uh, data sims and uh, portable MiFi units. So, so how is it? Homes that don't have broadband. Um, we're buying uh, predominantly Kindle Fires, the 10 screw, the 10 inch ones, which we're getting on good deals from Amazon. Um, but yeah, we, so we're doing that with training provided by our staff and volunteers, um, probably over a sort of, a, for most people, an average of two months. Um, we haven't got anybody who's come to the end of that yet because it's still quite a new project. But um, yeah, I think some of the things that were raised about obviously helping people to look at how they could get maybe cheaper devices if they're, uh, you know, if they're learning how to navigate a Kindle Fire, there are uh, smaller Kindle Fires that are about £80 on Amazon. And if they're doing one of their flash deals, you can get them cheaper than that. And, um, you know, we're getting referrals from job centres and, and places like that. And they're saying, well, if we're helping people essentially get work, then they're going to have money coming in that might uh, sustain them. But, yeah, that's something that we're very keenly aware of, because the worst thing is to get people digitally skilled and excited about what they can do and then take the devices away and then they fall off the end again. You know, so, um, but, yeah, the things that have been mentioned, uh, you know, um, today are really um, insightful about you know ways that we could talk to people about making sure that doesn't happen and what some of the options might be. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point you made about sort of helping people become digitally included, but then you don't want to take that, that away from them. Um, which is why I think it's really important that you think about the needs of your users at the beginning and whether or not a, a loan scheme is, is the appropriate way forward. And for a lot of people, it will be. And there, there's a lot of people that that's the, the right situation for. Um, but sort of thinking about that, that end bit, you know, what happens to people at that point, I think mm. is, is really essential. Can I yeah, also add the other, the other thing that we're finding with our project is that we're talking now to other partners. So um, housing associations are working with us for some of the people we're supporting because obviously we're helping them sustain their tenancies through online platforms. And uh, we're just starting a project with a local mental health uh, resource centre where they want to deliver all their mental health resources over Zoom. And some of their service users don't know how to use Zoom. So we're going to help their service users learn how to use Zoom and then pass them back so they can then have Zoom sessions. So I think it's for people who've got these tablet schemes, you know, do think about other organisations that could benefit from that as well within the community. Definitely really good point there about partnership working there, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely, because it's all those, yeah, the organisations that are delivering these services and these support networks and online is, is the way that people, the only way that people can access those at the moment. So actually, yeah, can work in partnership with those organisations and that's fantastic. That's great to hear, Stephen. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, there's, there's, there are some funding um, for individuals um, as well. So that can be a potential progression route. So could you work with your um, tablet loan recipients to, um, to help to apply for some of that funding for individuals? Um, we can put links to some of those um, funding organisations for individuals in the chat. Um, and some of those are sort of um, targeted at particular, um, particular needs, um, but that's something to put in place as well at the end of that loan agreement. I think uh, one of the things we've had really good experience of is working well with the referrers. So referrers working with an individual to make a, a grant application whilst we're supplying them with a loan tablet so that there's that linked up work. So having that really good relationship with referrers has been essential for us. OK, thank you. Um, it looks like I don't, I'm not going to pick a person for this, but there's a few people asking about um, remote login to tablets. Um, do you want to just say a little bit about how we do this, Anna, and, and also a bit about, you know, when we do it and, and the, the wider context of that kind of approach? Yeah, I mean, I've, I kind of will only do it in an absolute, um, yeah, when, when it's absolutely necessary. Um, a lot of the approach that we take as digital champions is about empowering people to do things for themselves. But there are times when actually changing those settings can feel or, you know, sort of getting in into the nitty gritty can feel overwhelming for them. 
indicate that they're at the beginning stage of the journey. Um, so I actually use screen sharing on Zoom more than I use um, remote access tools. Um, which, yeah, it's, it's about working. It's, it's very helpful to be able to see what the learner is seeing at the time and to guide them through that process um, more accurately. Um, but there are remote access um, tools you can use. Um, I have used um, TeamViewer Quick Support on tablets. That, um, so it is, it is possible and it can be done. Um, but there's privacy issues around that and um, the learner has to um, allow that remote access to happen. So it's important that we reinforce um, the user being absolutely safe in that and that um, so others can't gain access um, to that, yeah, to their device remotely. Um, so that's really important to reinforce that if you're going to use these kinds of remote tools. The other aspect of that that we talk about is that you know, TeamViewer, for example, gives a, a one-off code, which is for a time limited period so that the, the learner allows someone to control their device. But at the end of that period where they've allowed control, that's not the, the, the person who takes control can't just do it again when they fancy it. It's just for that, that time limited period. So really going through that with a learner beforehand to explain what the process is going to be and make them feel like they have the sense of control over it is, is important. Yeah, and ensuring that the learner is consenting to that um, is absolutely crucial. So every time you connect, asking, yeah, asking for consent to connect. Uh, Jackie Cole, you've got a, a simple question, or it might seem a simple question, but it'd be good to um, have yeah, you. Yeah, hi. Hi there. Thank you. Um, uh, James, yeah, my one was just how long do you loan these things for, you know, because you talk about exit plans, is it three months, six months, 12? I'm, I'm a very sort of newbie to all this, so just wondered what people do or what you would recommend. Interesting question, Jackie. Um, <laughs> the, when it was set up, um, actually, as a, um, as a crisis response to COVID, it was set up as two-month loans. Now, at the start of the COVID pandemic I think you know perhaps we didn't quite realize how long this was going to go on for so actually two months was not long for those um, and, and not long for some of the individuals that we work with as well um, for people that are new to um, the digital world it's it's not long to learn so actually we ended up extending that and so we we put in place so we sort of checking in and it's also an opportunity to check in with um, the referral organization um, and find out how that person's doing, um, which the digital champion regularly checks in with the person anyway, but it's, it's, a, it's a definite touch point for those people that, um, and we can assess from there. So we, we're, we've actually extended those loans out to, I think the majority of users have we, Katie? Um, yeah, I, th I think it, it was, it's sort of like um, a library scheme where people can maybe renew um, is what we've, we've, we've worked out is mm. that um, particularly, as Anna said, some people take a lot longer to get familiar with the equipment. Um, so by the time the two months has come around, uh, they may only be at a point where they're really sort of switching it on and, and able to connect to the Wi-Fi. So we realised that, that really wasn't long enough. Um, for some people, it is long enough. It's long enough for them to have a go, know that they want to buy a tablet and then and then buy a tablet and then they'll return it to us. So, so it really is sort of really dependent on the user and their needs. Thanks, Anna and Katie, and I hope that's useful for everyone else. Um, there's something that's come up a bit in the chat, which a couple of people can speak about. But I think it would be helpful for the purpose of the video just to get um, Paul Mazarek and then uh, Leon um, your response as well. But Paul, do you want to go first and just say a little bit about? Um... Yeah, um, it was I, I support people with um, learning disabilities and we've been giving some devices out and I've also been supporting people who've got their own devices and we're going to use Team Viewer. My home broadband was talk talk and I was having I was getting so wound up by um, not being able to connect with people and then it was just purely by another provider trying to link in with me um, and said well who's your broadband and I said talk talk she said oh that's it they've got a default setting that they they block all remote access devices or apps um, you'll have to um, 
but they didn't say you have to lift it, but you'll have to log on. And I did. I logged on using, I tethered to um, to it using my phone and things. So, yeah, so talk, talk. I don't know if any other providers do the same, but some of these um, replied Leon's obviously. Replied. Yeah, I'll, I'll hand over to Leon now, if that's all right. Just so yeah. you can just say this on for the purpose of the call, Leon. Yeah, hi. So, yeah, I work for Blind Veterans UK, um, one of the technology practitioners. So we work directly with members in teaching them how to access technology. Um, so, yeah, we've we've had um, quite a few members that um, are customers of TalkTalk. Talk, and because of their sight loss, we use some bespoke programs, um, things like you might have heard um, Guide, is quite a popular one and so is synaptic that they, they're like overlays to traditional computers and tablets um, and those uh, sight loss um, softwares are built in with remote support like tagged onto them because of the fact that it's more likely that someone who has sight loss might require some extra support so we have experienced it before um, the resolution for for us was uh, it is it can be quite tricky long process to try and get talk talk to lift the restriction um, but if our members contact them directly and sort of make it very clear that they they want it removed they have done it in the past but yeah it definitely has been a stumbling block um to give them that support sometimes thanks leon i think that's that's hopefully helpful to people and also interesting that um to, to hear about those those examples of other bits of software that you're using um, one question that's come up from lots of different people and for different reasons, so I'll kind of combine it, is just about um, which tablets um, we'd recommend. So, uh, Katie, you know, someone's asked about cheap or very user-friendly. Someone else has asked about tablets you'd particularly recommend for older people. I think there's probably a few others in there um, around specific things. Could, do you want to just say a little bit about the tablets that we've been using, um, Katie and Anna, and, and then perhaps we can bring in some other people to talk about the benefits of some of the tablets that they've been using as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll just caveat this with, I, I don't have a, a definite suggestion for people, but it is a, a, a process of looking at what's available. Often what, what's a good deal for, for your users and what they're going to need it for. Um, one of the, so we've, we've, uh, We've had different tablets for different schemes, depending on the funding that we've got. Um, so we've got experience of uh, Lenovo tablets, um, Huawei tablets, uh, Samsung tablets, and uh, we had some Actel tablets as well, didn't we? Um, mm. So we've, we've, we've had experience of all of those um, and they all come with different different drawbacks or, or you know, or, or bonuses. Um, I would say one of the things that we've discovered recently with with some tablets that we donated to people that we're supporting um was we've got some lenovo tablets that come with a huawei wi-fi box what would you call the wi-fi box anna the yeah so it's like a mo mobile wi-fi that runs off yeah. 4g yeah yeah yeah. yeah, the little mobile Wi-Fi box. And we're finding that we're having repeated connectivity problems um, with that um, and compared to our tablets, which have a SIM card inside them. Um, and so at the moment, we're, as, as our scheme, we're erring to the side of not having the, the tablets that come with the little Wi-Fi connectivity boxes. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that helps, but we've just, we've just found that that's really hard to manage with people who are less digitally uh, able. Um, yeah, it, it becomes another barrier where just to connect to the yeah the Wi-Fi box and it disconnecting, um, it's a, it's another layer to to have to deal with before people can even get online each time. It's yeah we're regularly coming into this, but um, I mean there are some tablets that are specifically designed for older users. Um, there's um, also lots to um, it's all about setting up as well. Um, really making use of those accessibility settings. Um, the text to speech options, um, whether that's add-on um, apps that might be helpful. Um, yeah, so really thinking about how to set that up for the users and the needs of the users as well. Um, simplifying the, the icons on the home page, um, putting the settings in the dock, um, just those things that really make it um, as accessible and easy to use for, those, for the needs of the learners. 
Thanks, Anna. I mean, some people have mentioned some other things in the in the chat. Lots of people mentioned the the um, Kindle Fire tablet. So I think that's a good tip that someone said that cases are essential. Um, and mm -hmm. Anna mentioned earlier that that's one of the things you need to think about is additional accessories that go with these things. Um, I think we've only got time for probably one more question before we do some um, wrap up with resources. Of course, if you've got, if, um, I, will, I will share all the slides um, with everyone who registered for the meeting. And I'll also share an edited version of the chat with the, with the questions people have asked, answers that people have given in the chat. And where there are questions that haven't been answered, I'll try and add in some, some thoughts to that as well. Um, Kingswood Estate, I don't know what your name is, but I'm going to ask you to unmute now and you can ask your your question, hopefully. Hello, my name is Lara Daniel. Go ahead. Yeah. My question is about the agreement that says it covers basic liability. If you become digital champion and uh, sign up to this loan scheme, what liability is going to be put on you? Sorry, I'm not sure I quite under, understand. Are you in, one saying... of the shards, in one of the shards, one of the oaths said, there is a loan agreement. In that loan agreement, there is a basic liability that it, has, that it covers. So who bears this liability? For instance, you, you loan a, a tablet to someone and they lost it, they broke it, so who, who bears that cost? Who bears the cost if something happens to the tablet that's, yeah. that's not right? Yeah. yeah. Katie, we, do, you wanna, do you wanna talk about that from our experience? Yeah, um, we, we have had some tablets that have been broken uh, or not come back to us for, for a variety of reasons. It's, been, it's only been a few out of all of the, the loans that we've, we've uh, facilitated, but there have been some that haven't. Um, and we have chosen as an organization to absorb those costs. Um, the la our tablet loan agreement does say that the person who is loaning the tablet is needs to look after that tablet and to return it to us. Um, so they have a, a contractual arrangement with us to return that. Um, however, the reality of, of, of of enforcing that arrangement is not really something that we're able to do. So, so I think it's actually a really good point about um, building into your tablet loan scheme some sort of understanding that, that there is going to be uh, there is going to be damage that happens that that, that does happen um, and thinking about how you might manage that in the long term yeah build, build that into your budgeting um, and devices do do break technology does break um, with every care taken in the world it still happens. Okay, because if they should break something, I'm looking at those who are suffering from mental health and you start hunting them, they need to fix it or they need to pay the money back and the process we think we are helping them, then we are worsening their situation. So that's why I'm trying to, to yeah. ask how that works. So we need to guide against that, yeah. Yeah, I don't... I don't think there's anything you can do to stop that from happening. So I think it's up to you as an organisation what you do when or if that does happen. Um, but I think that having the wraparound support with digital champions really helps prevent that as well. So having having good contact with the people that are receiving the tablets and having them in contact with digital champions who can support them really sort of helps them feel supported and looked after and part of the scheme. Um, and I, th I think that's why we've had, you know, relatively little problems with that. Okay. Is there a scheme whereby you give them the tablet straight away while you're supporting them? Yeah, I mean, we try and get the tablets out as quickly as possible. We try not to delay. So once we've got somebody's details, the, the most of the people that, who receive tablets from us are referred to us by another organisation. And um, so we also have a referral contact detail for them. Um, so if, for example, if we couldn't get hold of them, we can go back to their referrer uh, and see if they can support us in that process. Um, so yeah, we do try and get them out as soon as possible. We're gonna do, before, before I do the wrap up, just one, one last question which came through in the chat, which is about, um, do we lock the tablets down so that people can't install certain things on them? And someone else was asking a little bit more about that enrollment stuff. Uh, Anna, so could you just say a little bit 
more about that before we before we wrap up yeah i think that's definitely something to think about when um and again it's it's what's right for your in the individuals you're working with um I would be lying if I said there isn't some dangers about people being able to install their own apps. Um, one of our tablets had some malware, some quite unpleasant malware on it from a, an app that someone had them downloaded. So you, we need to be aware of that. Make sure you've got all, all your antivirus stuff that you can perhaps monitor the, the, the um, technological health of those tablets if any major issues arise. Um, so actually having something where you can have, you can look up a report on are there any viruses present in in your sort of fleet of tablets that have gone out. Um, but then there's also the sense of somebody, you know, wanting to do, you know, follow their own interests with that tablet. If um, somebody wants to download a creative app that they're interested in, um, by limiting the tablets that people, sorry, the apps that people can use on their tablets, um, people are you know also then being limited in terms of yeah, their own creativity their own interests so i think it's a, a balancing of those really to be perfectly honest um and it's all about what works best for your organization and for the individuals you're supporting um so i think that's something that um yeah, you will need to assess on a sort of um risk um risk benefit analysis yourselves really um, you can certainly provide us part of the Digital Champions. Um, there's ongoing um, work around how to keep yourself um, secure and safe when downloading apps um, and, and sort of, you know, a, a good sort of what to do and what, what not to do. But unfortunately, in the world of technology, these things do also happen. So, yeah, you'll have to balance those needs, I think, for your users. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, it brings us to, um, I'll do some wrap up resources now, but it's kind of a core, a core message of this whole uh, session that we've been running today, which is it's really about trying to um, assess what the, what the needs of those users are and do some, um, some work at the beginning of the, um, some work with the beginning um, of the project when you're planning something in terms of researching that yourselves, talking to those users yourselves, or talking to the organizations that are potentially going to be referring people to you. So some tips and resources. So first off, the Digital Brighton and Hope project, which we've been talking about, has a website. There's some information you might be able to find there, and you'll be able to get in touch with Katie and Anna through that. Um, in terms of um, recycled devices, which is one way that a lot of people are going to be looking at um, getting devices to people, there's the Reboot Project. Um, Rebootproject.uk is the website, which is provides lots of information about how you would go about thinking about doing that. Um, so there's a, a community forum on it. There's a free guide. There's a directory of organisations that are doing it around the country. So that's something you might want to have a look at. Ourselves at Citizens Online, we've got a web page on our website which collates lots of support resources that might be useful for digital champions to have a look at in terms of things they might want to be passing on to learners. And there's lots more other stuff on the website that would be interesting too. One thing that's particularly of interest potentially at this time of year is one of our partners, Digital Free Night, have put lots of ideas for helping people to connect over Christmas. Something that's perhaps a bit more lighthearted or that people who have so far through the pandemic not yet actually particularly develop their digital skills or got digital but they've got another prompt to do so around the festive period so they put some nice ideas for things that people can do on uh, a bespoke website around that. I mentioned right at the start of the call that we're doing some research which if you're um, involved in an organisation supporting people aged 50 to 70 with a lack of access to the internet or digital skills we'd really like to hear from you about how your service offering has changed as a result of the pandemic if you've started to do things remotely, if you've started to do device loans, if you've started to do different types of digital champion support, whatever it might be, we'd really like to hear about that. So you'll get um, a request to fill that survey in when I send the email around after the webinar and really appreciate you taking 10 minutes to have a go at that. And you might win a tablet um, as a result. Um, it's worth saying that we've also got a separate survey running for people who are aged 50 to 70 themselves, which might apply to you, we'd be very welcome to fill in our survey, but we'd also like it, we'd love it if you could pass that on to people who are aged 50 to 70, or perhaps if there's someone you're helping with digital skills, you could perhaps help them to fill in that survey so we can we can hear about, about people who are, uh, um, have lower digital skills or, or are newer to the internet. 
We've got a series of these webinars. Um, they're, they're designed to be monthly, but actually it's a bit haphazard this, this time. We've got this one, which is a bit later than a month on from the last one. And next week, we're gonna be running a final webinar for the year on um, the latest scam awareness. Um, we do find that a lot of the reason that people are reticent or a bit afraid of going online is because they're worried about being scammed. So the better we can enable them to feel in control, to know how to spot things that are out there and what to do if they see something that doesn't look right, then that can be really reassuring for people. So please join us next week if you're interested in that. And you can find all about um, the previous webinars we've done, um, where we've got recordings of all of them on our website, citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events. We've got lots of webinars that deal with, for instance, uh, providing remote digital skills support. Some of the questions around accessibility that have been coming up today are addressed and lots of other issues as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, You'll get the slides, as I said, they've got uh, my email address or Katie and Anna's email address via the Digital Brighton and Hove project. Um, so that's everything. Thanks for joining us today. I hope we, were, we helped you on most of the questions, if not all of them, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>